LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, something different, something special. If you've glanced at the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list recently, you may have noticed that the same book has been number one for a few weeks now, The Wager, a tale of shipwreck, mutiny, and murder by David Gran. Here's our producer, Caleb Bissinger, to take you back to the 1700s when this story takes place. It's 4.30 in the morning, May 14th, 1741. And after months at sea, the Wager, an ungainly British warship, is sailing off the coast of Patagonia, caught in a storm that has so blackened the skies, all the men on board can see is the darkness of certain doom. What was that? A wave? No, a sunken rock. And another, and another. The Wager's rudder snaps clean off. A two-ton anchor crashes through her hull. She can no longer be steered, can barely stay afloat as she stumbles blindly through boiling seas. This, the men are certain, is the end of their voyage. Some fall to their knees in prayer. Others lose their minds with fear. One tries to throw himself overboard. Another marches up and down the deck, waving a sword and screaming that he is the king of England. And then... It happens. The wager smashes into a heap of rocks. Her masts topple, windows explode, water rushes into the holds, sending the rats scurrying up to salvation and drowning the men too sick to leave their hammocks. The wager shudders and stills. She's gotten herself wedged between two great rocks, and miraculously, they're keeping her, for the time being, from sinking to the bottom of the thrashing sea, which soon stops thrashing. Clouds part, darkness lifts, and the surviving men, once their eyes have adjusted, can see through the mist an island. I'm Caleb Bissinger, and I base that scene on a brilliant new nonfiction book by the great David Gran. It's called The Wager, a tale of shipwreck, mutiny, and murder. That island, the one the men glimpsed through the mist, they made it there, but it was barren and cold. And after months marooned, they gave up any pretense of preserving naval hierarchy and descended into anarchy, cannibalism, and murder. They mutinied their captain, who they blamed for the wager's wreck, and worse. Then they devised a desperate scheme to get back to England. Astonishingly, it worked. They were welcomed home as heroes until their captain showed up and told a very different story about what had transpired on that godforsaken island in the Pacific. The captain and his treacherous crew duked it out in the press and the courts, fighting to convince the world that their account was the right one. Let the other side prevail, and you get hanged. Now, I know that probably sounds old-fashioned, a little macabre, but as you'll hear David describe in our conversation, he thinks it's a parable for our times. David is a longtime staff writer at The New Yorker and one of the most talented and successful nonfiction writers working today. His 2017 book, Killers of the Flower Moon, has spent 117 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. And it was recently turned into a movie by Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio that'll be out this fall. That duo is now at work adapting The Wager, which has also had its own remarkable run on the bestseller list. As of this recording, it's in its fifth week at number one. David is so successful, his books are so popular, that The Guardian wrote an entire article that was basically trying to figure out, like, what's this guy's secret? 
And the conclusion was that it had to do with two things. One, David is one of the most gifted storytellers of his generation. His books just have this cinematic quality. They leap off the page. And two, his attention to detail is unparalleled. One of his colleagues was quoted in the article as saying, his work shows the virtue of getting it right, of not taking any shortcuts and doing the deep reporting. How David Grant finds these stories, how he tells them, how he risks life and limb to report them when we come back. Hi, I'm Kwame Christian, CEO of the American Negotiation Institute, and I have a quick question for you. When was the last time you had a difficult conversation? These conversations happen all the time, and that's exactly why you should listen to Negotiate Anything, the number one negotiation podcast in the world. We produce episodes every single day to help you lead, persuade, and resolve conflicts both at work and at home. So level up your negotiation skills by making Negotiate Anything part of your daily routine. David Grant, welcome to the Next Big Idea podcast. Thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. So, David, your new book, The Wager, A Tale of Shipwreck, Mutiny, and Murder, tells the story of a squadron of five British warships carrying 2,000 men that set off in 1740 to cross the Atlantic, round the treacherous Cape Horn, sail into the Pacific, and seize a Spanish galleon that was said to be loaded down with untold treasure. And that seems to me like a pretty decent metaphor for what you do for a living. (laughs) You set off six years ago to tell this story, the story of this harrowing journey. You must have been uncertain as to whether you'd reach the destination, whether you'd get this project done. I doubt you faced murder, but you may have faced some mutiny of the mind, right? Some part of your brain saying, give up, David. (laughs) Why were you drawn to this story? What made you believe it was worth telling? And how did you find the courage, for lack of a better word, to keep going when the seas got rough? Yeah, so I do think that writing and research, you know, expeditions or odysseys, are a metaphor or a comparison for kind of the process because you do go on these quests searching for elusive facts or clues that you're trying to find. This story was an interesting one. I had originally stumbled upon an 18th century account by John Byron, who'd been a midshipman on the wager at the time. He also later went on to become the grandfather of the poet Lord Byron. And when I read the account, it had just these unbelievably arresting descriptions about scurvy and cannibalism and shipwreck and tidal waves and typhoons and you name it. And that was what first piqued my interest. I thought, well, this Mm. seems really kind of fascinating. It seemed like one of the more unusual and extraordinary sagas of survival and adventure I'd ever come across. But when you're looking for a story idea or especially a book idea, you know, you, you need to find other dimensions, deeper dimensions, if you're going to spend so much time on it. And for me, that was a process that kind of played out over months. When I began to look into this story, I discovered that there were these other accounts because several of the castaways kind of miraculously make it back to England where they are summoned to face a court-martial for their alleged crimes on the island. And if they don't tell a convincing tale, they're going to get hanged. And so they share these accounts and you know, after a long war against all the elements, they now begin to wage a war over the truth. And I would leave the archives, and I would come home, and I would you know flip on the TV or read the newspaper, and there would be these, you know, in our contemporary society, stories about you know so-called alternative facts or fake news or disinformation or whatnot. And then I would go to the archives, and I'd see there was misinformation and there was disinformation. There were even allegations of fake journals, a kind of 18th century allegation of a kind of fake news. And then I would come home, and I'd slip back into our modern world, and I'd be reading about you know, wars over history, who gets to tell history, certain books are being banned from curriculums. And then when I would go back to the archives, I would see that there was also a fight in this story over who would get to tell the history 
And there were even efforts by those in power to kind of cover up the scandal that was passed. So, you know, I started to feel like the story was this parable for our times. And it was kind of that compilation of elements that grab you. You know, you have this unbelievably gripping sea yarn. I mean, it's just the most unfathomable things happen to these men and boys on this voyage. But it also, I thought, had these larger resonant themes. So that's what set you on your way. But of course, then the doubts do come. You know, it's funny. I think you got your start as a political journalist. And this is a political tale, right? This is a yeah. tale of, of... Political intrigue. Yeah, political intrigue and how fights over power spill out into public discourse. It's really fascinating. Let's go back to the beginning and set the stage for listeners. It's the mid-1700s. Britain and Spain are at war. Ostensibly, the conflict starts because a British captain gets his ear cut off, or so he says, by a Spanish officer. That's not really what the conflict is about, is it? No, it's, it's a little like a Gulf of Tonkin incident for Americans who are familiar with the start of the Vietnam War. It's, you know, it probably did happen. There are some reports that this did happen, but it was really seized on as a pretext by British imperialists who were seeking to break the rivals' hold, that it was Spain's hold, over Latin America. And so Great Britain wanted to expand its empire and its colonial reach and its trade. And so that was the true hidden motive uh, for the war. And so the British Admiralty puts together this squadron of ships. It's five warships. Uh, there's two cargo vessels. There's one spotting sloop. These ships are sort of technically marvelous, but they're also rotting from the inside, right? I mean, describe them for us. They're both amazing and disgusting. <laughs> That's a good way to describe it. Yeah, they were these engineering marvels of their time. They were designed to be both murderous instruments, these warships. You know, they were designed for battle. And they were also designed to be these homes for hundreds of seamen who might live in close quarters together for years at a time. They have three masts. They can fly, depending on the size of the ship, uh, you know, as many as 18 sails at a time. And yet, as you said, they are also really vulnerable and could become kind of disgusting because they are made of very perishable materials, which was mostly wood. A single warship could take as many as 4,000 trees to build. Amazing. But that wood was susceptible to all the elements of storm and sea and worms would burrow into the hulls. You know, they didn't have copper hulls then. You'd have termites nibbling away. You'd have rats gnawing on sails and ropes and provisions. And so these ships had to be constantly repaired. And if you didn't repair them, you know, after a long voyage, almost, you know, rebuild them, they could sink on their moorings. So they were extraordinarily vulnerable. And of course, you had these people living very close together with very little understanding of disease. And so that also made it very perilous. And uh, I don't know if the word disgusting or just a, a very, very uncomfortable. And so the ships are not in tip-top shape. And the crew sort of isn't either. I mean, I was really shocked to learn about the pretty nefarious means that the Admiralty went to to secure men to work on these ships. You know, Great Britain then did not have conscription, and it had exhausted its volunteers of seamen. And these ships were very technical to operate them, and they really required a number of skilled seamen. And so what they did was they unleashed the press gangs, and these press gangs would roam ports and cities, and they would take a look at you, and if you look like you had any of the signs of a mariner, you know, if you had even little tar on the tip of your fingertips, tar was used a lot on ships to make things water resistant. They say, oh, that's a seaman. And they would just seize you. They would just grab you. They'd take you out in a little floating vessel that was like a floating jail and they'd load you onto the ship. They'd anchor the ship far from shore so you couldn't escape. And even after doing this, even after pressing many men for this expedition, they were still short of seamen. And so the Admiralty took the extreme step of rounding up soldiers from a retirement home. And these soldiers, many of them were in their 60s and 70s. They were missing an assortment of limbs from battles over the years. And some of them were so sick, they had to be lifted on stretchers onto these vessels, onto the ship, the wager. And everybody knew, even at the time when you read their accounts, that they were all sailing to their death. So all told, 
spread across these ships. There are about 2,000 men. And the wager, which is the the man of warship, um, the sort of ugly duckling man of warship that's the focus of your book, has about 250 officers and crew. And then there are all these supplies, too. Like, they're not just loaded down with human cargo, but there's 40 miles of rope on each boat, and there's 15,000 square feet of sail, and there's stables for chickens and pigs and goats, and there's an operating theater for amputation. There is a lot of amputation at sea. These are really floating cities. And you would think, or or at least I thought going into this, that— If you were going to spend the time and the money and the manpower and cut down all those thousands of trees and hire those hundreds of men to go on this sort of expedition, you would have a pretty decent sense of where you were going and how to navigate there. But that wasn't really the case either. I was again shocked to learn that captains were pretty good at calculating latitude using the stars, but longitude, which was their sort of east-west location— they were clueless, weren't they? Yeah, they really were. They had to sail partially blind, and this was true for seamen for centuries. Um, as you say, they could determine their latitude very easily by you know reading the stars, but longitude was this great enigma. And they had no means of measuring it because it would have required a reliable clock, and those had yet to be invented um, you know, by the 1740s that could go on ships. And so seamen had to... S- you know, rely on what was called dead reckoning, which, you know, relied on trying to estimate time by dropping a rope and counting knots on it and and also uh, turning over a sand glass to try to measure time. But it really amounted to informed guesswork and a leap of faith. And there was a reason why it was called dead reckoning, because so often it was wrong and semen ended up dead. So they set sail on August 23rd, 1740, And within a few months of their journey, they encounter an enemy. And it's not the Spanish. It's scurvy. And I remember when I was in sixth grade, David, we had to do a unit called the Explorers Project. And I was assigned Captain James Cook, who famously didn't discover the cure to scurvy, but was one of the first voyages where they had figured out, oh, scurvy, you can prevent it with vitamin C, with eating lots of citrus. And he had one of these famous voyages where no man succumbed to scurvy. And so in my mind, all these years later, I figured scurvy, oh yeah, vitamin C, it's not such a big deal. But this is an unbelievably atrocious disease. And it just cuts these crews down by their hundreds. Tell us about the effects of scurvy both on the body and then on on this voyage, what it did to these men. They didn't know then that the cause was a lack of vitamin C. And you have to remember on these ships, there was no refrigeration then. So they didn't carry fruits and vegetables back then. Um, Later, the British would carry limes and they became known as limeys. But back then, no. And for centuries, people didn't know. And yeah, I also had no idea how devastating scurvy can be the teeth begin to fall out, the hair falls out. Um, one seaman um, on this expedition described how the disease would get into their brains and they would go raving mad. Hundreds of members of this expedition perished early on in the voyage and their bodies were just dumped overboard. And the thing about scurvy was back then, it killed more people than other diseases combined for seamen. Some of the details in the book of like the surgeon opening up cadavers and finding their bones blackened or men who had old war injuries that were decades, you know, it happened decades ago and suddenly the bones that had been set for years snapped all over again, just grisly. And then all of a sudden you find yourself with, I think, as you put it, effectively a skeleton crew, that these boats require a huge amount of manpower to operate normally. And when you've lost hundreds of men, I think it's in some cases on some of the the boats in the squadron, they lost like three quarters of their crew. It's very hard to operate these, these ships. And of course, scurvy strikes them Right as they're approaching the most treacherous part of their journey, yeah, that right as they're approaching Cape Horn. Yeah, it strikes them at the very moment when they're going to need everybody to persevere. And, you know, these crews were so decimated, they sometimes didn't have enough people to raise a sail. And as they're coming around Cape Horn, and just for listeners who aren't familiar with Cape Horn, 
it is among, if not the worst place, the worst seas in the world. And that is because the water travels uninterrupted around the earth about 13,000 miles. Nothing blocks it. Nothing blocks the wind. And so it then gets funneled into Cape Horn and you have the strongest currents on earth. You have waves that can reach 90 feet and can dwarf one of these masts on the ship. And you have winds that often accelerate to hurricane force and can even reach 200 miles per hour. And there's a great line from Herman Melville, who later rounded the horn on a ship, and he compared it to a descent into hell in Dante's Inferno. And that's really what it was like. And so they are battling these storms. Their vessels are being bandied about as if they are rowboats. They're being submerged and deluged with water. They're trying to pump, and yet they are without enough men to properly operate the ship. So they are in dangerous, perilous circumstances. David, you live in New York. Yes. Which is 6,400 miles from Cape Horn. It's 2023, so it's 283 years from when this story begins. And yet you're able to write passages like this. If you'll allow me, I'm going to quote to you from your own book. And then the clouds blackened, blotting out the sun. The winds began to wail, and angry waves emerged from nowhere, exploding against the hulls. The sails convulsed, and the ropes whipped, and the hulls creaked as if they might splinter. Although the other ships gradually made headway, the wager, loaded down with cargo, was caught in the furious currents and was being driven eastward as if by some magnetic force. She was on the verge of being dashed to pieces. How do you do that? How do you write about an event that took place hundreds of years ago, before you were born, yes, thousands of miles from where you live, with such immediacy? So, you know, it really begins with research, and it's why these projects take so long. You know, like a description like that, which is a paragraph, you know, might have taken me months of research to actually accumulate the detail to be distilled, uh, hopefully, into that scene. And, you know, there is a surprising trove of firsthand materials from this expedition. There are, if you go to England and you go to the archives, you can pull out these log books and muster books and diaries and journals. You know, they come out of boxes and the dust just blows off them and the leather bounds around them are disintegrating and the pages are crumbling and you have to read them with a magnifying glass. But they give often a day-by-day -day accounting of what was transpiring and what they experienced. So you take all that information and you try to distill it to the most vivid essence. But the process of gathering that information, the writing in some ways is the easy part. The challenge is having the factual information to undergird it um, because I'm writing nonfiction. So that passage is about the wager, the ship that gives the title to your book. And as I said earlier, it's a bit of an ungainly man of war. They run into some trouble around the horn. What happens to them? So around the horn is these ships, which are their homes. They're with this squadron. Uh, the ships are kind of breaking apart. At one point, the wager loses one of its masts, so it's just plunging and pitching in the sea. Um, the sails keep blowing out on the ships. There's there's one account, which to me is still the most astonishing account of this journey around Cape Horn, where... They can't fly their sails on one of the ships so they because they keep blowing out or they'll be in danger of capsizing. But if you have no sails, you also can't really steer. You have nothing powering the boat. So you're just so vulnerable and you're just being tossed about. And so one of the commanding officers orders uh, some of the men, and many of whom were boys, to climb the mast as high as 100 feet and to use their bodies as sails. <laughs> and so they kind of stand there, concave as the wind, you know, whips against them, uh, you know, this gale force wind. And the captain is able to kind of turn the ship enough, but one of those seamen gets pitched into the sea because these vessels are rocking almost, you know, they're rocking like a complete pendulum and the tips of the booms, or they would call them the yards back then, were, you know, almost touching the water on each side. Sometimes they did touch the water. Wow. So you're just hanging on and one of them drowns. So, but the ships, to get back to your question, was 
as they're coming around Cape Horn, each of the ships knows that they need to stay together. And the Commodore, uh, the head of the expedition, is trying to keep them together because they know if one of the ships separates and something happens, there'll be nobody else out there to, to rescue them. And so they're firing their guns on all the ships, trying to signal their location. Remember, they didn't have communication. You know, there was no walkie-talkies or iPhones. So, you know, they're firing their guns in the storm so people could hear where they were. But ultimately, those sounds are drowned out by the wind. All the ships are scattered in the storm, and the wager suddenly finds itself all alone and left to its own destiny. The Anxious Achiever is the podcast about your mental health and your work, where leaders from top companies, entrepreneurs, athletes, celebrities, and leading experts share how they've managed through anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges, and how they've become better leaders in the process. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll feel seen, and you'll learn great tools and skills. And I guarantee you're going to look at leadership in a new way. Come find out why we won the Mental Health America 2023 Media Award. Get The Anxious Achiever wherever you find your podcasts. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the show. So it's the spring of 1741, and the wager, the British warship at the heart of David Grant's riveting new book, has just rounded Cape Horn and been separated from the rest of her fleet. Now, as he just put it, the wager is alone and left to its own destiny. The ship is under the command of Captain David Cheap, who decides he's going to try to sail on, rendezvous with the rest of the squadron, and finish the mission, find the Spanish plunder their ships. This strikes some of his men as delusional. To others, downright dangerous. A death wish, given the shape that the wager is in. Sails torn to shreds, water leaking in. Her crew, once 250 men, cut down to around 150. But as my guest David Gran will soon explain, Captain Cheap won't turn back because he's got nothing to go back to. So he drives the ship onward along the coast of Patagonia. And this is when they sail into that storm I described at the beginning of the episode. The one that ended with the wager jammed between two rocks, slowly sinking. And the men can just make out an island in the distance. So they take some smaller boats off the wager's deck and sail for what they hope will be their salvation. If I'm not mistaken, David, you've actually been to this island. Describe it for us. What's it like? Yeah. So, I mean, I began my research for the first two years. You know, the book took many years. So the first two years, I just combed archives. And that's usually where I always think I'm going to stay in those very safe confines. But there did come this point where I was gnawed by these doubts of what, what exactly is it like on the island? You know, you know what, did, what did they go through? Why did they descend into this Lord of the Flies? And so I made this trip there. I found this Chilean captain who could take me there in a very small wood-heated boat. And we traveled from Chilauea Island, which is about 350 miles north of Wager Island, along the Patagonia coast we went. Initially, we stayed within the channels and then eventually had to head out into the sea. And so I got a real glimpse of these terrifying seas as we were just tossed about violently. But the captain was very capable, and he manages to lead us through what is known as the Gulf of Sorrows, or as some prefer to call it, the Gulf of Pain, where Wager Island is located. And the island is still a place of wild desolation. It is windswept and barren and mountainous and cold and constantly raining or sleeting. And just like the castaways, we could find virtually no food. 
We found some of the celery they had eaten. And so in that visit, realizing how cold it was and knowing that they only had scraps of clothing, I had a better understanding that they were undoubtedly suffering from hypothermia, a term they wouldn't have used. They just kept saying they were freezing. And for the first time, I could really understand why this British officer had compared the island to a place where the soul of man dies in him. So these 150 men find themselves shipwrecked on this barren, fairly small island. And they basically try to recreate naval hierarchy, right? So they they live together based on their rank on the ship. The captain is still in charge. But as the supplies that they're able to salvage from the the wreck of the wager dwindle, and as their prospect of getting off of this island seems to dwindle as well, it starts to become an uneasy place. People start stealing food. There are fights. And the men start aligning themselves basically behind two leaders. One is Captain David Sheep who was the captain of the wager. And the other is a man named John Bulkley, who had been, I think, a gunner on the boat so farther down the the hierarchy. Describe these two men for us. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Why do some men stick with one and some with another? Captain Cheap was somebody who, before this voyage, back on land, he was always, he came from, uh, you know, the upper classes, but um, he had inherited uh, the money because back then it it went to the first son. Um, And he was always kind of plagued by debts and chased by creditors. He's kind of a tempestuous personality. But he would find refuge at sea in that regimented wooden world. And on this voyage, before the wreck, he had finally obtained what he had always longed for, which was to be captain of a ship. And so that was his great ambition. And he believed, you know, on this voyage, he could obtain glory, kind of prove everybody wrong. So when he gets on the land, onto the island, he is determined to remain the commander and to govern by the same rules that had existed on the ship. He's very brave, but also stubborn Mm -hmm. and rigid and volatile at times. John Bulkley, who was the gunner on the wager, was in many ways the most skilled seaman and an instinctive leader. Yet because he had not come from the aristocracy, he could never have been a commander of a warship. It was very unlikely. Yet on this island in this democracy of suffering, he begins to emerge as a leader. And many of the men gravitate to him, and he invokes such phrases as life and liberty. He is a formidable figure. He is very resilient. He is cunning, and he is determined to live. And while this battle for leadership is playing out, there's an ingenious carpenter or carpenter's assistant on the island with them who has this wild idea that they can salvage this, effectively a day sailor that was caught up in the wreck of the wager and break it apart and using a very limited set of tools, rebuild it and use it to get off this island. And Bulkley and Cheap have very different visions, don't they, for what that journey of escape should be. Yes, and the vision kind of reflects their characters and their personalities. And you know, even when they were on this island, they're having these philosophical debates about the nature of leadership and loyalty and duty and patriotism. And Captain Cheap uh, believes if they can rebuild this boat, they should sail north toward where there was a Spanish settlements, uh, who at that point were Britain's enemy. And they should try to then seize some trading ship or some kind of vessel. And would that go and try to rendezvous with the rest of the expedition or what remained of the expedition and continue with the mission? He is determined to, in some ways, redeem himself after the loss of the ship. And he is compelled by duty and his ambitions. And so he is invoking and trying to persuade the men with phrases like, patriotism and loyalty and duty and naval order. Bulkley has a 
completely different vision. He decides that the only way they're ever going to survive is they have to actually sail in the opposite direction, away from the Spanish. Because if they try to sail toward the Spanish, they're just going to get pulverized in this little boat, or they're going to get taken prisoner. And so he devises this really daring, but also really perilous scheme, which is to sail about 3,000 miles southward from Wager Island through the Strait of Magellan, which is just a little north of Cape Horn, where the seas are also really, there are a lot of storms and squalls. It's very dangerous. Wind through the Strait of Magellan from the Pacific side to the Atlantic side of uh, South America, and then sail north towards Brazil, which was a Portuguese colony where they wouldn't be taken prisoner. And so that is his scheme. And his argument is, you know, we are in a state of nature, and the old rules don't really apply, and we have to come up with our own rules. Mm -hmm. And the only thing for us to do at this time is to try to survive and save our lives. And so that is the pitch he offers many of the men, and many gravitate toward him. And of course, both of these proposals are, with the power of hindsight, completely insane. You know, (laughs) at one point, there's a fight between Chief and Bulkley, and Bulkley's like, steal a Spanish warship. First of all, these men are emaciated, malnourished, you know, their clothes are rags. And Bulkley's like, Chief, like, how are we going to steal a warship? We don't even have cannons, and we're on this makeshift boat that's sort of a jalopy. And Chief's like, well, what are our muskets for? (laughs) Yes. It's like trying to take your 1987 Toyota to like an F1 race. You know what I mean? Like to try to navigate the Straits of Magellan in this practically unseaworthy boat is also completely ludicrous. Yes, they are both. I, I, I If I remember the the line or something from Bulkley, it says something like, desperate situation, demand desperate you know, solutions or remedies. So his remedy is desperate. So ultimately, most of the men rally around Bulkley. Yes. And there's some drama we can leave for the, for the reader to discover about some things that happen on the island that lead to that. Before doing anything, though, before getting on the boat and leaving, they spend a lot of time drafting up these very official-sounding legal documents to justify why they're going with Bulkley and why they're abandoning their captain— You could think that after being shipwrecked and after seeing hundreds of their comrades die and after being on this island for months and nearly starving to death, that they would just give two shits about naval command, right? Like, okay, who cares? Let's go with Bulkley and get the hell out of here. But they take this chain of command and they take the customs and the rules of of the Navy very seriously because mutiny is serious business. Tell us a little bit about why they still feel so obligated to basically defend their decision. On that island, what's important to understand is they thought they might find their salvation, and it said that island turned out to be completely inhospitable, and they begin to starve, and they are descending, as you said, into these warring factions and committing all sorts of crimes and and spiraling into violence. And yet, even then, and when they're contemplating crossing this taboo, which was mutiny, they are deeply conscious of the admiralty thousands and thousands of miles away. It's as if the admiralty was just looming over them, you know, just peering over them uh, in judgment. And so part of it was, this was the world they had known on these floating civilizations, Mm -hmm. but they were also deeply conscious of the fact that if they ever did survive, if they did make it back to England, they would be held accountable for anything they did. They would have to face a trial. And so they begin to try to develop a kind of contemporaneous story filled with evidence and documents, petitions that were written, a contemporaneous journal that was kept to try to create an unassailable sea story that could withstand the attrition of a public or of a court-martial trial. And so that is what they're doing. Even in their desperate situations, they are, you know, almost legalistic with these documents they're developing and these political petitions they're signing. Okay, so about 70-odd men end up going with Bulkley. They leave Cheap behind with a couple of stragglers and a crappy boat. But just a few days into their voyage, their new voyage, 
there's a little bit of a hiccup. And one of the men who you mentioned earlier, this midshipman named John Byron, has like a crisis of faith. Is that a fair way to put it? Yes, yes. Byron ends up going back and rejoining Cheap. And Byron is this fascinating figure and someone who you seem to have a particular fondness for in this story. As you mentioned earlier, he is the grandfather of the poet Lord Byron. You write, Byron cut a striking figure with pale, luminous skin, large, curious brown eyes, and ringlets of hair. And he's a little bit of an unusual character among this ragtag crew because he's a gentleman. And as a gentleman, you know, he can do all these civilized things. He can draw, he can fence, he can dance, he can speak a little Latin. And yet there he is scaling hundred foot masts and sleeping next to the ship's amputation table and on the island suffering and struggling just as much as, as any other man. And this is probably a stretch, but I was trying to figure out what it was about Byron that drew you to him. And there's this part of me that wonders if you see a little bit of yourself in John Byron, right? That he's an adventurer, but he's also an outsider, right? And there's something a little bit similar, I think, between your role as a reporter, not when you do these historical books, but when you write a piece for The New Yorker, say, where you go on a boat in New Zealand and try to find a giant squid, or for your book, The Lost City of Z, where you yourself went trekking in the Amazon to try to gather details for the story. There's a little bit of the outsider-insider thing in Byron. I wonder if you feel a kinship with that. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, I To give the honest answer, I don't know. I mean, I think part of the thing that draws me to Byron, and I guess this would be a similarity, is that he is in many ways an observer. He is an outsider observing. He doesn't really belong to either of these factions um, in any kind of profound way. And he was just a boy when this voice hit out. So there's a certain innocence, almost naivete, about him. And he's influenced by these romantic tales he had read. And so, you know, he's thinking he's going to go off and kind of basically live a romance, a tale of the sea like the ones he had read. And yet he suddenly must come of age amid these horrors, not only unleashed by the natural elements, but also by his own shipmates on the island. And in many ways, he is my eyes and ears, and I think the reader's eyes and ears on this bewildering world. He is our kind of stand-in observer. I think there are probably some parallels, but I would say I don't really get so conscious about that. I'm so mm. trying to just understand each one of them and to render their point of view. But I think... Um, like I said, I do think he is in many ways our eyes and ears because he doesn't belong to such a faction and because he was a child. I want to leave it for readers to discover for themselves what happens to the men, those who follow Bulkley and those who stay with Cheap. But the remarkable thing is that both Bulkley and Cheap eventually make it back to England. And as you alluded to earlier, once they're back, this new war breaks out between them, a, a war of, of narrative, a war of words. What really happened on that island? Was it a mutiny? Was it something else? Was it justified? And this is, I think, a really interesting element of this story, and I think a, a moment where it transcends just sort of high seas adventure and becomes a meditation on this really fraught relationship between narrative and truth. And you write, these men believed their very lives depended on the stories they told. If they failed to provide a convincing tale, they could be secured to a ship's yardarm and hanged. So this is really a story where truth and narrative and story are life and death things. Yes. Yes. There's that famous line from Joan Didion where she said, we all tell ourselves stories in order to live. But in their case, it is quite literally true because if they don't tell a good tale, they may die. And so they begin to shape their stories. And I decided to tell the book from the perspective of three people who have kind of these warring accounts, Cheap, Bulkley, and the midshipman John Byron. And 
by doing that, and what was so interesting to me is we all shape our stories. You know, we all lied over certain facts. We burnish certain facts. We all kind of want to emerge as the hero of our tales. And in their case, you get to really see it playing out because you see in each of their accounts what one may lay out, leave out, and then what the other person may emphasize. It's not so much that it, they dispute the essential facts of what happened, mm. but the way they perceive them and color them to serve their own self-interest. And, um, and just to give one very vivid example, you know, one person may say, you know, I was forced to proceed to extremities on the island. And then another person may say in their account, actually, he shot the person right in the head. <laughs> <laughs> and it's through these kind of warring perspectives, I hope, I hope, my intent was that you get insight into the way we do shape our own stories and the way each of these uh, figures are shaping their story to live with what they have done and also in many cases what they have not done. And it's only when you see the interplay of the accounts that I do think you get closer to what the real truth is. John Lennon said, count your age by friends, not years. I've always liked this quote, and I've tried to apply it. Always be building new friendships, expanding communities. And I've tried to apply the same approach to the process of learning. Always be learning, ingesting new ideas, testing my assumptions. But where can you find a flow of the best new ideas vetted by experts? There is so much noise out there. I'm so glad you asked. This is why we started the Next Big Idea Club. We've partnered with hundreds of the world's leading nonfiction authors to create audio summaries of their books. We call these summaries Book Bites, and our app features a new one every single day. You can listen to a book bite in 12 minutes or read it in five. There's no other place on the planet where you can listen to book summaries created by authors themselves. And that's not all we have waiting for you when you download the Next Big Idea app. We also have video and audio masterclasses, ad-free versions of this podcast, new original audiobooks, and tons of other member benefits. So what are you waiting for? Open your app store, search for the Next Big Idea. There is no better way to get smart fast. Download the Next Big Idea app right now. I want to close, David, by zooming out and talking for a moment about the way that you shape your stories. I was listening to an interview that you did about one of your other books, Killers of the Flower Moon, which is about the serial murder of uh, members of the Osage Nation in the 1920s. And you said in that interview that to write that book, you had to find a new style, right? One that was suited to that story. And you came up with something that was spare and had elements of the Western in it. And I wonder if you went through a similar process with The Wager. Did you have to find a new style that felt suited to the time that you're writing about, to the voices of these men, maybe even to the genre of high seas adventure that stretches from Melville to Patrick O'Brien? Yes, I wanted this voice to be different. You know, I wanted to feel within the genre and play with the genre of the adventure tales and the kind of stories that these actual figures were reading at the time and telling themselves, and then also sharing and shaping <laughs> later. And I wanted the style, therefore, to be a little more playful mm. because of that. And within that form, I felt a little more freer with the style and with the descriptions. And so, yeah, I read a lot of Melville. I read, you know, Lord Jim. I read Patrick O'Brien. You know, it's hard to know how they influence you, but they no doubt do. Some people have such distinct voices as writers, and it's kind of the voice they always have. But for me, both structurally and tonally, I try to create one that suits the material and let it grow out of the material. And so there's always that, you know, you, you asked me very early on about the doubts and the challenges and, mm -hmm. you know, so early on when you begin to write, that's the doubt. Like, what is the voice for this exactly? <laughs> you know, how do I capture the voice that fits it? What is the right structure for the book? And, and, and you know, you want these things to reflect the themes of the book. They're not arbitrary. 
I think it's something that's really exciting about reading your work. It reminds me actually of, um, of E.L. Doctorow. You know, it's so funny. I was going to say E.L. Doctorow is like, I think the one novelist who really always does this. He comes up with a new style and voice for each one of his novels, and I love him. <laughs> yeah, I do too. And that's one of the joys of reading him, that the voice of Billy Bathgate is so different from the voice of Ragtime. Yes, or Daniel. Exactly. Yeah. Well, David, the first book of yours that I read was The Lost City of Z. And I actually listened to it as an audiobook on a cross-country road trip with my girlfriend and... We were so riveted that after driving for 9, 10, 11 hours, we would get to our campsite, make our tent, climb in there, and keep listening to the audiobook. And as I was reading the wager to prepare for this interview, she and I were in the car, and I found myself describing the story to her and describing these shocking conditions of what life was like on these ships. And we ended up sitting in our driveway, parked, as I just kept telling her detail after detail, and she was again riveted. So thank you for these books. Thank you for taking us on these fabulous, beautiful, scary, thrilling adventures. And thank you for being on the show today. Oh, it was my pleasure. It was a lovely conversation. Thank you. That was David Gran, author of the number one New York Times bestseller, The Wager, a tale of shipwreck, mutiny, and murder. He asked that we not spoil two things for you listeners. What was that murder? And what happened back in England? Whose story prevailed? You'll have to go buy the book to find the answers. I promise you will not be disappointed. One more thing before I go. We've been talking a lot lately about AI and the threat it poses to writers. You know, the Writers Guild is on strike right now. And one of the reasons, one of their chief concerns is that they're not protected from Hollywood execs trying to replace them with AI. And one of the things that I love about David Grant's work is that no AI could do what he does. I mean, I challenge, this is an open challenge, I challenge any AI to go to the dusty archives that he goes to, to dig up documents that haven't been seen in hundreds of years, let alone digitized, Documents that are so fragile, you've got to rest them on pillows as you turn the pages. I challenge any AI to somehow do that and then to transform the findings through an act of imaginative empathy into a spellbinding narrative. Maybe I'm being naive. Maybe this will change in the future. But for now, I'd rather read David Gran on his worst day than a large language model on its best. Today's episode was written and produced by me, Caleb Bissinger, Sound design by Jason Freeman. Next week, Rufus sits down with Peter Atia. You won't want to miss it. See you then.